The goal of this example is to determine the effective length factors for columns AB and BC shown in the sketch below, and then check to see if they have adequate capacity for the load shown. The frame is an unbraced moment frame in the plane depicted, and all joints can be considered to be rigid. Consider only buckling in the plane of the frame shown in the sketch, and use A992 steel. I should mention that this is an example that comes from the companion to the 16th edition of the AISC Steel Construction Manual. If you haven't already watched it, check out my lecture on the basis of the effective length factors, link shown here, and check for additional links to videos in the comments below. I'll start off by calculating the stiffness ratios for the three joints that bound the two columns that we're interested in. Considering first joint A, we calculate the stiffness ratio as a sum of I over L for the columns that are framing into the joint, divided by the sum of I over L for the girders that are framing into the joint. There's only one column framing into joint A, the W14 by 82 column framing in from below. It has a moment of inertia of 881 inches to the fourth and a length of 14 feet. There are two beams framing into the joint, one from the left and one from the right. And they're both W18 by 50 sections with moments of inertia equal to 800 inches to the fourth and lengths of 35 feet. Thus, the stiffness ratio for joint A is 1.377. Next, considering joint B, there are two W14 by 82 columns framing in. Each of them has a moment of inertia of 881 inches to the fourth, and each has a length of 14 feet. There are also two beams, both W24 by 55, with moments of inertia of 1,350 inches to the fourth, and each with a length of 35 feet. Thus, the stiffness ratio for joint B is 1.631. Finally, we consider the stiffness ratio for joint C, the fixed base of the column. In this case, we have one column framing into the joint, but there aren't any beams or girders framing into the joint. One way to look at this situation is to envision the rotational restraint as an infinitely stiff girder framing into the base of the column. Thus, if we take some positive number in the numerator divided by infinity in the denominator, we would end up with a theoretical stiffness ratio for joint C equal to zero. The effective length method is covered in Appendix 7 of the 2022 edition of the AISC specification. The alignment charts that we're going to use to determine the effective length factors are found in the commentary to Appendix 7. If we read through that commentary, we can find that the cases of pinned and fixed spaces are addressed directly. Specifically, the commentary says that if the column end is rigidly attached to a properly designed footing, G may be taken as 1.0. Smaller values may be used if justified by analysis. In our case, we know only that the column base can be treated as fixed. So we'll take G as 1.0 for joint C. Now that we know that G sub A and G sub B are 1.377 and 1.631 respectively, we can now determine the effective length factor for column AB. First, I'll use the alignment chart by drawing a straight line from 1.377 on one side to 1.631 on the other side. Then we can see that K is approximately equal to 1.4 or 1.5 based on where that line crosses the center axis. Alternatively, we can use the equation to calculate K and in this case find that K is equal to 1.483. I'll use K equal to 1.483 later on in this example when I calculate the strength of this column. Similarly, with G sub B and G sub C equal to 1.631 and 1.0 respectively, we can now determine the effective length factor for column BC. Using the alignment chart, by drawing a straight line from 1.377 on one side to 1.0 on the other side, we can say that K is approximately equal to 1.3 or 1.4 based on where that line crosses the center axis. Alternatively, we can use the equation to calculate K, and in this case, find that K is equal to 1.427. I'll use K equal 1.427 later on in the example when I calculate the strength of this column. 
Next, we'll calculate the required strengths for the columns. Using the load combinations from ASCE 7, we find that the required strength for column AB is 250 kips, and that the required strength for column BC is 600 kips. As a first step in calculating the available strength of the column, I'll check the flanges in the web of the W14 by 82 to see if they're classified as slender or non-slender for compression. For the flanges, we have B sub F over 2T sub F equal to 5.92, and for the web, we have H over T sub W equal to 22.4. We can find these values tabulated in Part 1 of the AISC manual. Zooming in a bit and looking more closely at the W14 by 82, we see that B sub F over 2T sub F is tabulated as 5.92 and that H over T sub W is tabulated as 22.4. The limiting values of lambda R are found in table B4.1A of the AISC specification. Case 1 applies to the flanges, and case 5 applies to the webs of rolled I-shaped sections. Zooming in a bit, we see that lambda r equals 0.56 times the square root of E over F sub Y for the flanges, and that lambda equals 1.49 times the square root of E over F sub Y time for the web. We can now calculate values for lambda sub r and find that lambda sub r is equal to 13.5 for the flanges and 35.9 for the web. Thus, we can determine that the flanges and the web are non-slender for steel with a yield stress of 50 KSI. In fact, in this case, the flanges would be non-slender for steels with F sub y up to 259 KSI, and the web would be non-slender for steels with F sub y up to 128 KSI. The next step is to calculate the effective slenderness ratio, KL over R, for the column. The problem statement instructed us to consider buckling only in the plane of the frame shown in the sketch. And the sketch indicates both that the webs of the columns and the girders are in the plane of the frame, and that the columns are bent about their x-axis in the plane of the frame. Thus, we need to calculate KL over R with respect to the strong axis. When we look up the strong axis or x-axis radius of gyration in part one of the AISC manual, we find that R sub x is equal to 6.05 inches for the W14 by 82. Using this value and K equals 1.483, we find that the slenderness ratio for column AB is 41.18. This is less than 200, as is required by Chapter E of the AISC specification. Note that normally, we would compare the slenderness ratios for the two axes, the X and the Y axes, to determine which axis controls flexural buckling. In this case, however, we were instructed to consider only buckling about the X axis, so KL over R with respect to the Y axis was not calculated. Since KL over R is less than 4.71 times the square root of E over F sub Y, F sub critical is equal to 0 0.658 to the F sub Y divided by F sub E power times F sub Y. F sub E is equal to pi squared times E divided by KL over R squared, and in this case is equal to 168.8 KSI. And then F sub critical is calculated to equal 44.17 KSI. Next, P sub N is equal to F sub critical times A sub G, and in this case is equal to 1060 kips. And then finally, phi times P sub N, the available strength, is equal to 0 0.9 times the nominal strength, or 954.1 kips. So, since P sub U is less than phi times P sub N, the column is adequate with respect to buckling about its strong axis. Finally, we perform a similar set of calculations for column BC and find that it too is adequate with respect to strong axis buckling. 